Okay, folks, I've been given the signal to get things started. So if we could all find a seat. Um, good evening, and I'd like to welcome all of you here. Um, my name is Annette Shaw, and I have the privilege of serving as the uh, chairman for the Women's Steer the Women's Fund Steering Committee of the Ashland County Community Foundation. And we're thrilled to support the Ashland Center for Nonviolence by co-sponsoring this evening's program with the AU Gridiron Club. I wanted to start my opening remarks by briefly telling you a little bit about our Women's Fund. In 2004, the Ashland County Community Foundation's board established a steering committee to design a fund to serve the needs of women in Ashland County. The mission statement for our Women's Fund is this to create a permanent legacy that enhances the lives of Ashland County women. To carry out our mission, we award grants to 501c3 and other qualifying charitable organizations to help to, and this is for in three areas, encourage women to achieve self-sufficiency, to educate women about community needs, and to encourage women to participate as donors to build a permanent endowment. To date, the Women's Fund has provided 35 grants totaling $65,636. With that money, over 4,900 women and children in Ashland County have benefited in some form from the programs and projects that have been funded. In the past three years, grant monies being given have increased by $25,000. This, this is due to the support of our donors who believe in the mission of the Women's Fund. I hope all of you had the opportunity to, to visit our display table in the back of the room. We would very much like to encourage you to pass on the information about the availability of our grant funds to any group or organization that you think might be serving women and their families and help us expand the influence of our, dollar, of our grant dollars. I would like to thank the Ashland Center for Nonviolence for allowing us this opportunity to share with you a little bit about the work of the Women's Fund. Um, its grant-making programs and the impact that it's being made on local women. The Women's Fund is very excited when we can partner with other organizations in our community to bring these types of events with outstanding speakers like Joe Ehrman to Ashland because we believe that working together we can make a difference in our community and beyond. I would like to close with a quote from Helen Keller. Alone we can do little, together we can do so much. So with that said, the Women's Fund is delighted to have the opportunity to team up with uh, this evening with the AU Gridiron Club so that together we can do so much for our community that we all love so much. Uh, thank you and enjoy your evening. And at this time, I would like to call forward Lee Owens, who is the head of Ashland uh, University's, head coach for Ashland University's football team, and he is going to introduce our speaker. Lee. Thanks, Annette. <clears throat> I really appreciate that. What a great crowd, and welcome everyone this evening. You know, when I started here 12 years ago, we couldn't get this big a crowd to the stadium for football games, you know, so this is, and it's not like, I know it's not, guys, it's not like that anymore, but uh, uh, I, I appreciate the football team in attendance here this evening. You know, they started workouts this morning at 5.30 a.m., so it, uh, it's, it's great that, they, that they're here with us. I just want to thank a few of the folks who made this uh, possible this evening and a few of the organizations. Dr. Craig Hovey, the Executive Director of the Ashland Center for Nonviolence. Craig, really appreciate all your help and your leadership in this event. Dr. Mark Hamilton, our Associate Professor of Philosophy. Dr. Hamilton, would you stand up for just a second? He's also, uh, he, he's also our faculty rep to the NCAA. And uh, I think most of your, your, your students from your classes are here this evening too, aren't they, Dr. Hamilton? Uh, Mr. Don Graham, who's the president of our Gridiron Club, uh, and obviously one of the sponsors is the Gridiron Club of our, our event here this evening. It's quite, it's quite an interesting partnership with the, the Gridiron Club and the Women's Fund of the Ashland Community Foundation, as well as the Ashland Center for Nonviolence. So, but all those groups are responsible for making this evening possible. Uh, let's meet Joe Berman. You know, Joe's an inspirational and dynamic speaker. Um, he's a seminar leader. And he's worked with lots of organizations. We, we, we talked uh, today on the way back from the airport, a lot of work with the NFL in particular. With these organizations, he works to promote growth and teamwork, effectiveness, and individual responsibility. His approach to this vital work is grounded in lessons and experiences of his own remarkable life and the pro profound of impact that he's had on others. 
Joe Orman was an All-American football player and a lettered lacrosse player at Syracuse University. He was named to Syracuse University's All-Century football team and the recipient of the Ardence Award was the Syracuse University's most distinguished alumni honor for his contributions to society. Joe was the 10th pick in the first round of the 1973 draft. Uh, he played at Baltimore for eight years, went to the Pro Bowl in 1978. Also that year, he was the Colts. That's when the Colts were in Baltimore. He was the Colts Man of the Year, as well as the winner of the Ed Block Courage Award. Joe finished his NFL career with the Detroit Lions, and then he played three years in the USFL. Uh, again, he mentioned on the ride back from the airport again today, his last head coach was a guy by the name of George Allen in the USFL. Quite an experience that might have been. Uh, Joe Roman first began to redirect his life in 1976. That's the year he lost his brother to cancer. Uh, it was a year he also spearheaded efforts to conduct a run or to uh, construct a Ronald McDonald's house in Baltimore in memory of his brother Billy. He also started to take some seminary classes at that time and was eventually ordained in 1985. You know, uh, I was first introduced to Joe after reading, like many of you, the book Season for Life, which was written in 2004. In this book, he was the subject of the, that was a New York uh, Times bestseller, um, Season of Life, written by Jeff Marks. And he was recognized for his revolutionary concepts of team building, mentoring, and coaching. Uh, author Marks was actually a ball boy at Baltimore when Joe played, and then they reconnected after Joe had left, and, 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 and Mark's just become fascinated with his ministry and his coaching as a volunteer defensive coordinator at this all-boys high school in Baltimore. For those of you who've read the book, um, you, you know what the things I'm talking about. It's, 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 it's a great read. Uh, Joe Orman has received many awards. Just to give you a few of them, he was featured on the cover, cover of Parade magazine and called the most important coach in America. He was named one of the top 100 most influential sports educators in America. He was selected by the Baltimore Business Journal as the Renaissance Person of the Decade. He was the National Fatherhood Initiative Man of the Year. He was the, Nash, he was the Frederick Douglass National Man of the Year. He was recognized by the National, Con National Consortium for Academics and Sports for using the power and appeal of sport to positively affect social change. That's just a lot of recognition, a lot of great awards there. I first heard Joe Ehrman speak at an ASCA convention luncheon several years ago, and at this event, there were about 5,000 football coaches, and he challenged the football coaches at that luncheon to really ask themselves five questions. He challenged the coaches at that luncheon to ask themselves why they coach. He challenged the coaches at that luncheon to ask themselves why they coach the way they coach. If their coaching is worth imitating, if, if how they define coach coaching and success in coaching and finally and finally how does it feel to be coached by them and as, as we walk out of that lunch and you're thinking about I've got to find the right answers to those questions and I've worked really hard to do that ever since Jonah's wife Paula of over 30 years have four children like myself two two girls and two boys His one boy was an all-american lacrosse player the other a linebacker for uh, for Wake Forest so at this time let's please welcome the most important coach in America Joe Earlman well let me say what a pleasure it is to be with you and I want to thank uh, Coach Owens for the introduction, and uh, oh, where is the football team? Right here. Well, I tell you, and and the and the, and the ride back from the uh, coach picked me up at the airport and the drive uh, over here from Cleveland. Uh, uh, I can just tell how fortunate you are. I, I would say this: there's two kinds of coaches in America. There are transactional coaches, and there are transformational coaches. Transactional coaches basically use young people for their own identity, their own validation, their own empowerment. With transactional coaches, it's always about them first. Uh, the team second and players need somewhere down the road. They usually function from some quid pro quo. You meet his need, he'll give you some kind of praise or plaudits. And then there's another kind of coach, which is much more rare. They're transformational coaches. 
They understand the power, the platform, the position, and they're going to use that to change the arc of every young player's life. So I would say this as a football team, you have a tremendous pleasure here, uh, a privilege uh, to play for a man like that. And uh, I, I suspect over the years you'll continue to appreciate that. So thank you for that introduction. My friend Mark Hamilton, good to see him again, uh, the professor. Um, and his students are here. Is he much loved or what? Yes? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, much loved. Well, uh, let me just tell you a couple quick things about me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. One, I'm a product of the 1960s. So I was in high school and college right at the convergence of the civil rights movement, of the women's rights movement, the whole war on poverty. And I think as a nation, we started to ask all the right questions. What is the role of race and class and gender and sexual orientation as it speaks to the inherent value and worth of every human being? I think America started to ask those questions almost 50 years ago, but they still haven't been answered in this country. We still live in a world filled with racism and sexism and all kinds of isms that marginalizes and minimalizes other human beings. And I would say to the students here, it's going to be under your leadership that you're going to help move America to a more fair, more just position so that every man, woman, and child can live with dignity and status, have an opportunity to participate in this American uh, 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 dream. So, um, so for 40 years now, I've been working on social justice issues on the streets, uh, in the church, and in the world of sports. And that reminds me, if you have a cell phone, would you make sure that's on silent or vibrate? The true story, I was preaching in a church not too long ago on a Martin Luther King Sunday, and I was preaching about the history of racism in America. Racism is part of America's original sin. Our nation was built on the genocide of one group of people and the enslavement of another. And while we've come a long way in the past 400 years, there is still disparity and disportionality in almost every category of well-being when it comes to racial issues. A mixed audience, 30 minutes at the end of this sermon, uh, you could hear a pin drop as everybody was working out their own enculturation and true story. Somebody sitting right over here, their cell phone went off and it was set to the song, play that funky music, white boy, and like crushed 30 minutes of setup. So if we get to one of those moments, don't you be the person with your phone on uh, uh, tonight. Uh, second thing about Mary, I've been married uh, 41 years now. My wife, Paula, uh, she's a psychotherapist. Uh, all of our friends say I drove her into that field. I think there's a certain amount of truth to that. But much of the work that we do is built around a thing called attachment research. Attachments about the capacity to build and maintain relationships. Forty years ago, there was a psychoanalyst in Great Britain working what we then called juvenile delinquents. He started to make the connection between the way these children were parented, early exposure to violence to their outcome. Ended up asking the question, why is it that some parents have the ability to allow their children to relate to them at social and emotional development? Why do some parents have that capacity and others don't? 30 years of research came back and said the single biggest predictor of a parent's ability to optimize the human potential of their ch child is when they've made sense out of their own life. When you have a coherent narrative, when you've integrated the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you have this correct autobiographical data and history. And what the research showed was it didn't matter how suboptimal or abusive your own childhood might have been, you weren't destined to repeat that in the lives of your own children once you made sense out of your own life. Well, what my wife and I did was take that research and said, if that's true in parent-child, then it's got to be true in coach-player, a teacher-student, a leader-follower. I think the greatest challenge, and I would say this to the students here tonight, I think your greatest challenge is you have to develop your own narrative. You have to define you are, who you are. Nobody gets to define you. Nobody gets to define your masculinity. Nobody defines your femininity. It's not defined by your culture, your ethnicity, your race, your socioeconomic. You have to define that. What you're going to stand for, who you're going to stand with, and what you're going to stand against. That's every man, every woman's challenge. All of us got to do our own self-narrative work. And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey uh, uh, in developing your own self-concept. How did you get to understand who you are? And who you understand who you are, is that really who you are? Is that really the highest version, the highest level of yourself? So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. And then uh, uh, the, the third thing I'd say about myself as coaches that I'd played uh, professionally for 13 years. 
And the thing about I loved my time in the NFL was the fact that every summer 90 men would come together. They were black, they were brown, they were white, they came from the inner cities, the suburbs, the farmlands of America, and they created this community called a team. And you learn if you're gonna be an asset to your community, a part of the community, you've always gotta find your well-being and the broader well-being in the, the entire community. It's always about seeking the highest values for the greatest uh, 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 common good. So my last five years that I played, I went to seminary my off seasons. Retired from uh, uh, football, finished up seminary, and then my wife and I moved in one of the poorest census tracts in Baltimore, Maryland. A distressed community, objective and psychological poverty. Started working on issues of mercy, food, shelter, dealt with evictions, after school programs for kids that were locked in a school system that couldn't provide the resource or access to allow those children to optimize their own human potential. And no child in 2016 should the geography of where they're born ever dictate their destiny. Then I saw, you know, that ghettos in America were man-made. They were constructed on bad public policy and prejudice. They were designed to deny certain people access and opportunity in America. And my thinking was if they were man-constructed, therefore they could be deconstructed. So I spent years working in housing, economic development, uh, systemic racism, a number of issues. I was about four or five years into my work when it suddenly dawned on me. You know, there's an even greater crisis in this country. There's a crisis in America that's foundational to just about every psychosocial problem we have. And if you don't address this issue, you can't address the myriad of problems and issues that reside within this country. And to me, the single greatest crisis in America today is the crisis it's a crisis of masculinity. It's a crisis about what does it mean to be a man? How does a boy know when he's become a man? What are the values, what are the virtues that describe some kind of authentic masculinity? And I would ask each of you, uh, as men and women, in your own minds, how do you define what it means to be a man? As a man in this audience, what's your clear, compelling definition about your own masculinity? What drives your own masculine soul as you move through this university and out into the world? I think every man has to self-define. Every man has to have a clear definition of who they are, and nobody else gets to define that for you. So I started working on those issues, which took me into the world of sports. Uh, sports is the largest men's club in the world, and there is a, there is a, a, a value system within there that's not healthy for turning boys into men. There needs to be some kind of counter story. So that brought me back in. I do a lot of, a lot of work in the NFL. Uh, uh, just about every NFL team has to have a 90-minute mandatory player conduct session. To me, the thing that moves most men from the sports page to the criminal page usually has to do with the false concept of masculinity. When men feel devalued or disrespected, out comes this anger and rage that leads to all kinds of issues within our culture. So about a year and a half ago now, um, I was invited up to the NFL office and uh, it was after the Ray Rice incident. Ray Rice was a Baltimore Raven running back, uh, was accused of, uh, of punching his uh, soon-to-be wife, knocked her out and got a two-game suspension. Well, there was a blowback in America. 40% of NFL fans are women. And there was a blowback to the commissioner's office about uh, correcting that, making sure that was right. So Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, had invited about seven or eight people up to the NFL office to try to figure out how do you get in front of that? What's the preventive? What's the penalty? Uh, how should situations like that be treated? And in the midst of that, Roger turned to me and asked me if I would speak to character coaching. Can you coach character in a way that would eradicate many of those uh, issues that are being surfaced in the NFL, but are part of our culture, as we all know. And I turned to him and I said, no, I don't think so. One, you can't build character on faulty masculinity. Uh, if masculinity is defined by power, dominance, control, you'll never be able to build moral character on that. Now, there's two kinds of character. Uh, there's performance character. That has to do with relationship to yourself. These are things like the term self-determination, grit, overcoming obstacles. They're all about you and your performance. The other kind of character is moral character. That's how you relate to other human beings, how you treat other human beings. These would be things like empathy, 
a kindness, a moral courage. And what we're learning in sports is that sports is built in about performance character, but we're not doing near enough job on building moral character in the lives of young people. And moral character always trumps performance character. So you look at all these great performance character athletes that are morally failing. And the longer you uh, play, the higher level you achieve, every study shows that the more morally callous you became. So I ended up, I have a, 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 a one-year initiative I just completed to redeem high school sports in America. Uh, sports are broken in this country. Uh, we're in this win-at-all-cost kind of culture that serves no one. Uh, the scoreboard's dictating everything. So what we have is a $6 billion uh, youth industry that popped up almost overnight. You have this professional D1 revenue producing sports and professional sports, and both of them are just squeezing the life out of high school sports. So we've got to be aware of the brokenness, and then we've got to have some kind of common language to have a conversation in this country. The goal of sports is always to win, but it's not the purpose. The purpose of sports connected to educational institutions is one, to connect uh, uh, students to their learning community, two, to connect them to caring adults, and three, ought to be about the human growth and development of human beings as they participate uh, in sports. So I've been doing a lot of work on, on that issue. So then I started working on all this stuff on masculinity, and then I saw right behind this crisis of masculinity is a growing crisis on the issue of femininity and womanhood. And again, how does a girl know when she's become a woman? What are those values? What are those virtues? What's a clear, compelling definition that's going to drive your own feminine soul as you move out into this world? Let me just break down these constructs of masculinity and femininity. I want to kind of show you how violence just seems to, to permeate from the socialization process that's taking place. And that's what we've got to interrupt. Um, I would say this, let me, let me talk about masculinity first, and then I'm going to talk about femininity, and then I'm going to take some questions uh, from you all. So I would suggest this, and as the men in here, as I talk about men, you think about your own narrative. Think about how these things impacted your own self-concept, about how they impacted how you move on this, uh, uh, on this campus, how you move through life. And then when we get to the feminine part of this, as women in here, uh, think about how these lies have impacted your own self-concept, your own self-understanding, and how you move as well. So I would say this. I would suggest that the three scariest words that every man receives in his lifetime is when he's told to be a man. And I would say starting at the age of five, six, seven years old, when significant men in our lives tell us to stop, uh, uh, to be a man, it's almost always in the context of stop acting that way. Stop with the tears, stop with the emotions, don't be a mama's boy, some kind of sissy, be a man. And what young boys in America learn at a very early age, to have emotions, to show them, to share them, to name them, somehow those things are considered signs of masculine failure. So what you have at a very early age, boys starting to separate their hearts from their head, trying to live life from the neck up. So as men in here, as you think about your own narrative, who told you to stop crying? How vivid is that memory? At what age did you become embarrassed about your own emotions, about your own feelings, about showing those tears, about showing your humanity? At what age did you start to separate your heart from your head, living life from the neck up? Be a man. Be a man is almost always in the context that you're not enough. You're not tough enough. You're not strong enough. You're not masculine enough. You're not athletic enough. You're not sexual enough. You're just not enough. Be a man. And boys in America are taught. They have to earn their masculinity, unlike girls who have it given to them. So be a man. Who told you? Then every boy in America is fed three fundamental lies in this culture. Now, when I talk about culture, I'm talking about the messages from the movies, the media, the magazines, Madison Ave, 24-7. And every boy in America has been fed these three fundamental lies. So the first lie is this. Well, let me just back up for a moment uh, on those lies and say this. I would say that every one of us in here has two fundamental natures. We have this first nature that we inherited. Your basic body type and size, your eye color, hair color, skin color, all of that was DNA directed. You had no say over that whatsoever. But every thought you have about yourself, 
Every thought about how lovable, unlovable, worthy, unworthy, competent, incompetent, every single thought you have about yourself, you've acquired. All that information has come from outside of yourself and has been placed in you. So we're born in this world, we come into the world with this true nature. We have intellect, we have emotions, we have free will. We're naked, we're open to the world. But as we go through life, we get wounded. And on this journey from childhood to adulthood, all of us get all kinds of misinformation, not only about our own value and worth, but about the value and the worth of that person sitting next to you. So as we get wounded in life, we start to create these egos. We figure out that we're just not quite enough. We need to project, we need to present ourselves in a different way. So all of us at a relatively early age start to create these egos. They're always fixated in some point of pain in the past. It's that recognition that I need to be more. So you start creating these egos. And uh, with that ego comes this inner critic, the super ego. This is the voice up here in your head that if it was another human being, you'd never have a relationship with that voice. You would never allow another human being to talk to you the way that you talk to yourself. And I think the spiritual journey in life is how do you break down that ego? And how do you get back to your true essence, your true self, apart from the woundedness and the pain? And that's the challenge for each and every one of us. And that's a lifelong journey, learning how to quiet that voice. Because this voice is the thing that'll keep you from reaching your highest, fullest potential, from getting back to your true nature. Can I, can I give you a tool for a moment? Let me, just so we walk out of here with a tool. How many recognize uh, the students in here? How many recognize that voice, that inner voice, that critic up here, constantly putting you down? Everybody recognize that voice? That dictates how we move, doesn't it? It dictates whether you, you're just going to raise your hand. You don't want to look stupid. That voice is already, always talking to you. And, and you've got to learn how to become awake, how to become aware of that voice. There are other options than just paying attention to that voice. So part of what I do in our own, I think all of us have to have some kind of discipline. Uh, I'm 67 years old, but I continue to work every day. How do I get to the highest, best version of who and what I am? So here's what I like to do, and, and, and then I'll pick this back up. But I want to walk out. I would like to give you one tool before you walk out of here. I'm going to ask you to just sit up in your seats, if you would. I'm going to give you a tool to break down that voice, and then I'll get back into what I was doing. So just kind of sit up, and right in here is your mind's eye. Now take your mind's eye and just shoot it down to your feet. You don't need to look, but get your feet nice and grounded on that ground. Make sure you've got good contact. You're firm. Kind of put your hands on your thighs. You want to lower your ears from your uh, uh, shoulders. So just take your mind's eye, shoot it down to your shoulders. Lower them down. You want your head, your esophagus is kind of, your head's like it's on a helium boom so you can breathe. So here's what we're going to do for just two minutes. I'm going to ask you to breathe. I'm going to ask you to take your mind's eye and put it on your exhale. Every time you exhale, put your mind's eye in there. And as you focus on this exhaling, every time a thought comes into your mind, you're gently going to chase that thought out and catch the next exhale. We're going to learn we don't have to pay attention to this voice. So go ahead. We're going to, we're going to breathe out of our diaphragm, uh, six, two, seven, six breath, uh, uh, a six count intake. So just kind of take a deep breath to a count of six. All right, six. Now hold it for two and then let it go to a count of seven. Six, two, seven. We always want to breathe deep in our diaphragm. So I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to take two minutes. I'm going to ask you to just focus on your breath. Every time a thought comes in your mind, just gently chase it away and grab that next breath. Go ahead, take a deep breath. Put your mind's eye on your exhale. Thought comes in your mind, just gently chase it away. All right, just take a deep breath and come on out of that. Well, I can tell you all were terrific. Uh, you all were terrific at that. But you can see uh, many of us will go through a whole day and our mind's not where our body is. And until we learn how to quiet this voice, 
we'll never be able to really build our own narratives. We'll never really be able to uh, uh, self-define. So let me go back. So we got this three words, be a man, three scariest man words every man receives. So uh, then every boy in America is fed three fundamental lies about what it means to be a man. Uh, the same lie that was fed to me when I was a boy have been fed to each and every one of you as young men. The first lie is this, and I think every boy learns this first lie by the time they're six, seven, eight years old. You learn this on ball fields and playgrounds and during recess all over our community. And that is as a culture, we teach young boys that what it means to be a man has something to do with athletic ability. Somehow we associate masculinity with size or strength or some kind of skill set that allows you to compete on that playground and win. So some of you were the boys that could catch it down and out or hit the hanging curve. And what happened on that playground is you got elevated. You were seen as having more value, more worth than the other boys on that playground. And what I want to say is that is an absolute lie. Being a man doesn't have a single thing to do. Athletic ability, size, strength, the capacity to compete and win. See, some of you were the boys that want to do music or dance, drama, computers. You should have had the freedom to pursue however your essence, however you were wired. But in this culture, those boys were pushed against the periphery of the playground and impregnated with this idea, I don't have what it takes to be a man based on the first lie of this culture. So you need to think about your narrative. How much of your own self-concept is based on that first lie? of this culture, whether you are an athlete or considered a non-athlete. Second lie is this, and I think every boy in America learns this today by the time they're in junior high school, and that is as a culture we teach young boys that what it means to be a man has something to do with issues of sexual conquest. What's it mean to be a man in many parts of America? It means you have the capacity to bring some young girl alongside of yourself and then use her. Use her to either gratify some kind of physical need or use her to validate some kind of masculine insecurity. That certainly doesn't make you a man. That makes you a user of other human beings. Then later on, you get the third line in this culture of masculinity, and that is we associate ma masculinity with issues of economic success, as though you can measure what a man is based on his job title, position, power, the amount of possessions someone has accumulated. That, too, is a fundamental lie. The problem is we live in a culture where all kinds of men associate their self-worth with their net worth. Now, I could take those three lies from the ball field to the bedroom to the billfold and tie them into just about every social problem we have. And I don't care whether it's boys with guns, girls with babies, immorality in boardrooms, or the beatdown women take in this country. You watch television. You watch advertisements, particularly during sporting events. You watch those advertisements directed toward men. You'll see one, two, or all three of those lies embedded in every one of those commercials. Because advertisers understand that as a man, if you don't have a, a clear definition of who and what you are, then advertisers can make you nervous about your masculinity. They can teach you that if you drive this, wear this, drink this, have this kind of woman on your arm, somehow that's supposed to validate who and what you are. So as men in here, when you think about your own self-definition, how you move your own self-concept, how much of it is tied to the lies of this culture? How much of it still comes from that ringing endorsement to validate, prove yourself as a man based on all the wrong definition? How much of your self-concept is built around uh, your relationship to women, athletics, or how much, money, uh, how much money you make. Think about that concept. So you take that mandate to be a man, you take those three lies, that then produces this thing called alexithymia. A-L-E-X-I-T-H-Y-I-M-I-A. It's a Greek word. A means without, lex means words, and thymia means emotions and feelings. It's an inability to put your emotions and feelings into words. American Psychological Association would say over 80% of American men suffer from some form of alexithymia. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that when we're five, six, seven years old, we're told to stop with the tears, stop with the emotions, never even given permission to develop a vocabulary to express all of our feelings and emotions and to separate our hearts from our heads. And this is ground zero for social problems, ground zero for violence. For violence. Because as a man, if you don't understand your own emotions and feelings, very difficult to understand the emotions and the feelings of another human being. 
If you can't verbalize how words and actions impact you, very difficult to understand how your words and actions are impacting another human being. Creates what I call an empathy deficit disorder, an inability to understand the feelings and what causes the feelings of other human beings. Ground zero for social problems, bullying, hazing, dating abuse, gender violence. Boy, when you are disconnected from your own heart, lack an empathic connection from other human beings, boy, that is a recipe for bad kind of outcomes. It's a recipe for violence as well. Violence is any intentional act to do harm or inflict uh, uh, injury on another human being. Uh, boy, when you're empty in here, boy, confused about who and what we are as men, boy, that is a tremendous propensity to try to validate or prove, and violence is one of those forms that we use to validate masculinity in this culture. So you take that be a mandate, three lies, that produces a lexithymia, then what you see is kind of a covert masculine depression in America. It's not clinical, you're not pinned to a bed. But what you see are men, three fundamental, uh, uh, three fundamental outcomes of this. First thing you see is a tremendous number of men that live in isolation, do not know how to enter into meaningful relationships or community with another human being. When you look at the moral failure of men in the media almost every day, front page, business page, or sports page, it's almost always because men lack one meaningful relationship in their life. To be a man and not have one person in your life that knows the deepest struggles, the issues, the temptations that you're dealing with, that is a dangerous place to be. It's never, you never get to hear yourself verbalize. You never get any kind of feedback. You never get any kind of accountability. Boy, you are out there uh, 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 on your own. Isolation is destroying destroying young men that don't know how to come into any kind of authentic community. So a tremendous numbers of men. Uh, and to be a man in here tonight and to not have one person that knows what's going on in the deepest recesses of your mind, boy, that's something you really got to change. You really got to have one person that knows and understands. And every, every man may need some man that's out in front of them, just letting them know they're on the right path. And every man needs some kind of brother to walk through this life with, heart to heart that knows and understands who and what we are. So the foot, first footprint is isolation. The second is substance abuse. And I don't think there's anything more painful going through life feeling like you don't quite measure up as a man. And given the cultural definition, you're going to never have a long enough athletic career, you won't sleep with enough women or make enough money to ever feel fulfilled and satisfied based on that definition. So men start to medicate the pain of not feeling men enough. Alcohol, drugs, sex, materialism, pornography, whatever you need to attach to in order to feel more secure about your own uh, uh, masculinity. And, and what happens is when boys don't know how to emote, are disconnected from their hearts, they put on these emotional straitjackets on us when we're four or five years old, we don't know how to rip them off. So what happens is when you look at the binge drinking, which is at the at, at, at the bottom of an awful lot of gender violence, boys, because boys are trying to take off this gender, uh, this uh, emotional straitjacket. We want to be able to say we love you. We want to be able to say we're bros. We want to be able to hug and love other men, but this culture restricts us from doing that. And it's not until boys feel they have to get, uh, you know, hyper drunk until they have the freedom to start uh, 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 being with other men. So you've got that isolation, you've got substance abuse, and then the third footprint result of this socialization is violence. You know, America is one of the most violent nations in the world. We're 5% of the world's population, and yet we're 25% of all incarcerated people in the world. But you think about violence done toward girls and women. The most dangerous place for a woman isn't to be on the street after midnight. It's in her home. And we're going to have one to three million women this year that will, will, uh, uh, will be physically and or sexually abused by intimate partners alone. We'll have over 650,000 rapes reported in this country, one every 36 seconds, and everyone that works in the field agrees those are underreported by almost five or six to one. One out of five teenage dating relationships involves some kind of physical and or sexual force. See, what we've done is raised up generations of men that think they can use their size, their strength, their power to hurt, control, and manipulate uh, uh, girls and women. And we've got to raise up a generation of men that self-define, aren't dictated to by this culture, have their hearts connected to their heads and learn as a man how to function out of that heart. The heart is what defines us. 
The heart's the source of empathy. It's empathy that we need for other human beings that's going to create the moral courage for some of us to raise our hands and to say we need to stop this action. We can't allow this on this university. Boy, moral courage is probably one of the, one of the uh, missing, uh, most missing pieces in this culture today. And I'm someone, you know, I'm, I'm around a lot of the uh, high school gang rapes and I go in and speak after some of those things and the sect that, and it is unbelievable to me. Young girls being gang raped and uh, people taking pictures, boys and girls, tweeting, and no one with the moral courage to just walk in and to stop that stuff. I think every man's got to define his own self. You have to define what you're going to stand for, who you're going to stand with, and what you're going to stand against. And every one of us has to define our own masculinity. Uh, uh, you've got to do your work, and you've got to have some kind of discipline. I do 20 minutes of breathing every morning just trying to quiet those voices that are in my mind so I can live out of the essence of who and what I am. All of us got to get back to this true essence so that those are the lies of masculinity. Then what does it mean to be a man? How are we going to raise up a generation of boys that has a true understanding of what the essence of masculinity truly is about? So let me talk about femininity for a moment. Now, I think every girl in this country is given that same mandate to be a woman. It's not as confrontational, it's not as in your face as boys receive, but every five, six-year-old girl checking out of every convenience store, every magazine cover, every music video is screaming at you to compare yourself to the cultural construct that's been given to you. And every girl in America has fed three fundamental lies about her femininity and womanhood as well. And the first lie is this, and I think girls in America learn this by the time they're four or five years old, three, four years old, often sitting on their grandmother's knee. And that is, as a culture, we teach young girls this myth about Prince Charming, that somehow worthy women will be rescued. That word worthy is always a code word. It means that if you're just thin enough and just pretty enough, there's some man out there that's going to come and sweep you off your feet and make your life complete as though you as women don't have enough courage, enough conviction, enough fortitude to make your lives whatever you want them to become apart from needing to be rescued by some man. Second lie every girl in America learns by the time she's eight, nine years old. And that is as a culture we teach young girls that their value, their worth as a woman, as a human being is somehow dependent on her beauty, body, type, and size. So you look at the number of eight, nine-year-old girls in this country already dissatisfied with their physical appearance, dieting, thinking about dieting. They already view their bodies not from the inside out, not how their bodies perform and function for them, but from the outside in. How do other people rank and appraise my own physical appearance? And then by the time a girl gets to high school, she's under this tremendous pressure to abandon her authentic self. Girls are taught they have this polarity of choices to make. You can either choose to be honest, authentic, and real with who and what you are, or you can choose to conform to this construct to be loved, popular, and accepted. And whenever girls conform to the construct, it's to take the locus of control that's internal and put it in the hands of other people. And this is when girls start to lose their own moral compass, just like boys do whenever they conform to the cultural construct. So that then leaves every girl with this tremendous sense of inadequacy uh, we have this idealized standard of beauty that is so unreachable, so unattainable, so photoshopped that it leaves every woman. Every woman can tell you every physical force she has. It leaves us tremendous pressure to abandon your authentic self. And the footprints that you see in the lives of girls in America, uh, first thing you see is self-abuse. Tremendous number of girls that take that anger of not having what society dictates have, they feel they don't have, what society dictates, many girls will take that anger and turn that inward on themselves or the only other acceptable place for girls to be angry, and that's what other young girls. You have the same kind of medication of the pain of not quite feeling woman enough. And then you have this, uh, you know, we'll have, we'll have 11 to 14 million girls and women uh, diagnosed with anorexia, bulimia, some kind of body dysmorphic disorder as well. So as women in here, you think about your own narrative. You know, who told you to be a woman? Well, when did you start judging yourself based on the lies of this culture? Boy, is it all about that Prince Charming? If I'm not married by the time I'm 30, my life will be ruined. Is it all about body type and size? You view your humanity, the essence of who and what you are, based on a package. 
you uh, uh, have abandoned your authentic self, all of us got to live out of the authenticity of who and what we are. And again, it's about getting back to our essence. We've all got these egos. We've all been closed up. We're all projecting something. And if we're ever going to come together in some kind of authentic community, being honest and real, all of us got to get back to our own essence. And that's the spiritual journey. And that's what you've got to break down. So if those are the lies of masculinity, those are the lies of femininity. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Let me give you my definition of masculinity. Now, I think there are only two criteria to define what it means to be a man. And I think there's only two criteria that define what it means to be a woman. And to me, they're both the same because they're about our common humanity as men and as women. So I learned this. I was in my six-year professional football. My mother and grandmother had raised four children in Buffalo, New York. Uh, two sisters and a brother 10 years younger than me. Uh, not having a father in the house, I raised him really not only as my sibling, but really as a son. When he was five, I was 15, somebody to be reckoned with in our neighborhood. And I taught my brother what I knew about being a man. Athletic ability, sexual conquest, and the way out of our neighborhood to the money was through sports. So he had just graduated from high school, a national recruiting football, getting ready for his freshman year of college. I got him a job that summer in training camp with the Colts. I wanted him to come in and learn the work ethic of a professional athlete, the skills and techniques of a defensive lineman. And it was the very first week of training camp, the middle of July. I'm sitting on a taping table getting my ankles taped for an afternoon practice when my brother walked up to me with this massive black and blue mark on his chest. Our trainer saw that, sent him to the doctors for a blood test. That night, I got a call from Johns Hopkins Hospital. Bring your brother there right away. And upon admitting him into the hospital, a doctor pulled me aside and said, listen, uh, Billy's got cancer, and it's a type of cancer where there's virtually nothing we can do for him. And I remembered being absolutely devastated. Devastated, one, by the thought of losing the person that I probably loved the most in this entire world. But I think I was equally devastated by the reality as my 19-year-old brother lied on his deathbed, tears in his eyes as he faced his own mortality, I recognized at that moment that everything I had invested my life in, all of my awards, my achievement, my accumulation, I recognized offered him no help or hope whatsoever. I was this socialized male that at a very early age had separated my heart from my head. Never had the language, never had the vocabulary, didn't know how to express my love and appreciation for my own brother. And I ended up devastated by the thought of that. I ended up having a cot put in next to his bed. And I literally spent every night of an NFL season except for away games on that cot. So I'd get up in the morning, have breakfast with my brother, go to practice, come back, have dinner with him, and then try to help him make it through the night. Five months I spent on a pediatric oncology floor. Five months in a waiting room with all these other families that had children facing life-threatening illnesses. And if you ever want to know where truth and perspective and authentic community resides in America, it's in those waiting rooms. Because when someone you love gets diagnosed, you suddenly get a clear perspective about what's really important in life, what you really want for the people you love and you care about. And you see all these secondary issues that create so much angst and anxiety in our lives, and you recognize they matter for absolute nothing. You had this tremendous sense of community. Because when you landed on that floor, you recognize it wasn't just about your child. It was about every child on that floor. And when good news walked in that waiting room, some child's white cell count went up 10 points, some bone marrow match was made, everybody celebrated that. And when devastating news and death walked in that waiting room, everybody tried to dissipate that as well. Five months I was there, it was down to the, it was a week of the last game of the season. My brother was down to his last day or two on this earth. And I made a decision to take him out of Hopkins Hospital to my home in Baltimore so that he could die in the presence of the people that had loved and nurtured him. And I'll never forget wheeling him out of that hospital corridor uh, knowing it was going on almost instant death. Put him in my car, drove over to the stadium where my teammates were practicing. They came out to the car and they lifted this defensive lineman, maybe 105, 110 pounds, 
carried him into the locker room. I undressed him. We put him in one of the whirlpools. And as he sat there soothing his aching body, one at a time, my teammates came up to him and in a clandestine way said goodbye. Uh, had his dog, had his friends come down from Buffalo that night, uh, celebrated an early Christmas only to watch him die the next morning. Five months to prepare for his death, but the reality and finality was devastating to me. Took his body, flew it back up to Buffalo. Uh, my teammates and coaches came. My cousin played with the Bills. The organization showed up. And the turning point in my life, I'm standing in the cemetery the middle of December in Buffalo. The snow's blown. Hundreds of people out here for this young boy. I'm standing next to his casket, next to the open grave. And at the end of the ceremony, I hear the priest say the final amen. And with that, everybody turned and just started to walk away. And I remembered wanting to scream. You mean this is it? You live, you have some good times, some tough times, you die. And then everybody gets on with the busyness of their own life. What's the meaning of life? Where does value and purpose come from? I was 29 years old. I was six years in the league. I hit the long ball in that boy code, athletically, sexually, economically, and I had no concept. No concept what I was about and no concept what life was about. And I started this long inward journey trying to find the answers to life's most profound question. And ultimately, my question became, what does it mean to be a man, to be a woman, to be a human being? My conclusion is this, it comes down to two things and two things alone. Now I know this not only from my own personal journey in life, but I've been in pastoral ministry over 30 years. I've done hundreds of funerals. Used to preach at a multi-thousand church for a long time. And in my faith tradition, part of my job is to sit on the deathbed of dying people and help prepare them for the next stage of life, if you will. And here's what I know to be true for me. And I know to be true for every single one of you. If you were on your deathbed today, knowing that you were going to die tomorrow, and you wanted to measure what kind of man, what kind of woman, what kind of success you had in life, it'd come down to two things and two things alone. And the first is this. On that deathbed, you will recognize that all of life is about relationships. It's about the capacity to love and to be loved. What's it mean to be a man? It means you can look somebody in the eye and say, I love you, and receive that love back. You know what the question you're going to ask at the end of your life? They're not going to be about awards or achievement or how much stuff you accumulated. They're all going to be questions of relationships. What kind of mother was I? What kind of father? What kind of husband? What kind of wife? What kind of son? What kind of daughter? What kind of member of the community was I? Who did I love and who did I allow to love me? See, I would say the very essence of who we are as men and women always emanates from the heart. It's the heart that defines us as men. It's the heart that defines us as women. It's the capacity to love and to be loved. It's the heart that we need to develop. The heart that's got to keep open. That's the heart that's a source of empathy and compassion. All the right values emanate from the heart. So as we think about who and what we are in the midst of breaking down our egos, we've got to get back to our heart. It's the heart that doesn't define us. It's not this culture, it's not our parents, it's not other people. Every one of us has to self-define. What are you going to stand for? Who are you going to stand with? What are you going to stand against? How are you going to define yourself and move through this world? And I would say first and foremost, it's all about relationships. It's about the capacity to love and to be loved. So here's the second thing, and again, to me, it's the only other thing. You're on your deathbed today, about to die tomorrow want to measure what kind of man, what kind of woman, what kind of success you had in life, it come down to this. At the end of your life, you want to be able to look back over and know that you left some kind of mark, some kind of imprint, that you made a difference in this, this world. All of us are here. We have a responsibility to give back to this world, to make the world more fair, more just, more hospitable for every human being, for inclusion. We need to be about the cause of elevating all human beings elevating the human spirit. And at the end of your life, you're going to be able to look back over and know that you didn't just take up space in this world. All of us got to put a stake in the ground. Racism, sexism, whatever the ism is, all of us have a responsibility in the name of the inherent value and worth of every human being to elevate, to start breaking those things down and to live a life just for self. Boy, that is a very, uh, uh, not a nice death. 
Uh, uh, that is a very difficult dying process to have lived a life just for yourself. So relationships, commitment to a cause. Now for those of you that are athletes or, or musicians, those of you that are parts of groups, uh, think about that for a moment. If being a man and a woman is about relationships, commitment to a cause, then what's a team? A team is nothing more than a set of relationships for a cause. Every team has common purpose. You've got performance goals and objectives. There's a mutually accountable work ethic, but every team's built on the trust, the respect, the integrity, and the dignity of every team member. And every great team I've ever coached, every great team I've played for, has been great for two reasons. One, the players are relationally connected. Depend on, be dependable for. And two, they've totally bought into the cause of their team, mind, body, and spirit. So all of us got to do our own self-definition you need to make sense out of your own narrative. And I would say this in closing before I take some questions. Uh, you are signs of hope. Boy, in the midst of all the craziness that's going on in this country, in this world, you have to be signs of hope. Boy, your students at a university like this getting an education that you're getting, boy, that's not just for you. Boy, that's to help grow you as a human being to be relationally successful and cause-oriented in life. And I would say this to each and every student here, your signs of hope, your signs of hope. The function of hope is to always keep present realities open for future possibilities. Well, we live, we live in a world where tremendous numbers of people need to know that tomorrow can be different from the day. 650,000 rapes, one every 36 seconds, one to three million women being abused. Boy, we've got to raise up a generation of men that are self-defined not dictated to by this culture, and then learn how to come together in some kind of authentic community. So we're signs, agents, and we ought to be foretastes of hope. Uh, that's the challenge for each and every one of us, but that hope only comes from your own self-definition. So I'll close with this is kind of give you, you know, that breathing is a very powerful exercise. Start with a mini goal. Do 15 seconds. Build up to 30 seconds. Build up until you can start keeping that voice quiet. But I'll, I'll give you this as a challenge when you get back to your dorms or your apartments. Uh, I would challenge you to go to like, like a Google search engine and put the number 100 in there. The number 100 and then write the words greatest speeches. 100 greatest speeches. It'll take you to a site that has what it considers the 100 greatest speeches that have ever been recorded in English. And you can hear Winston Churchill leading a nation at war. Uh, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address is on there two of Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches there as well. And when you listen to these speeches, you'll see that every one of them is about two fundamental things. They're all about our relational responsibility to other human beings. We are our brother's brothers. We are our sister's sisters. We have responsibility locally, nationally, and globally to other human beings. The second thing that every one of these speeches is about is commitment to a cause. How do you build a world more fair, more just, more hospitable? Uh, elevate the human spirit, relationships, commitment to a cause. Now, my favorite out of all of these speeches was given by Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel is a German concentration camp survivor. He wrote the book Night. And when President Clinton was in the White House, he invited Wiesel to come speak to dignitaries from all over the world. And you can hear Wiesel step up to the microphone and lets the audience know that on the very next day, would have been 47 years to the day, that he had been liberated from a Nazi concentration camp by American soldiers. And he said, while he had no English language at the time, he could look into the pupil of those soldiers' eyes and reflected back was all the misery, the suffering, the inhumanity that he had experienced. And he said, you know, the one hope that we had, the one hope that allowed us to live through the day, go to bed at night, and even think about confronting another day was the hope and the belief that once the world found out, once the world understood what was taking place inside those ghettos, they just knew the world would come rushing to their deliverance. And they expected that tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. And Wiesel says in this speech that his greatest disappointment, almost surpassing the experience of a concentration camp, was to get his deliverance to re-enter the world and to find out the world knew and did almost nothing about it. And Wiesel said, the greatest problems in the world are apathy and indifference. And whenever you're apathetic and indifferent to the pain and plight of other human beings, that's always to take sides with the oppressor and deepen the pain of the victim. 
Bizel said, you know, the opposite of life is not death. It's living unconcerned uh, about other human beings that you could offer hope or hand or a help to, but you choose not to. He said, the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy and indifference toward other human beings. He said, uh, he said uh, 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 the opposite of faith is not heresy. It's apathy and indifference. It's when you claim some kind of higher power in the vertical and then discount horizontal responsibilities. Well, I would say that each of every one of you, well, we need you to stand up as signs of hope, of agents of hope, of speaking truth, of speaking about the inherent value and worth of every human being. And when you see something and when you hear something, or that speaks against the value and the worth of human beings, all of us got to have the empathic connection and the moral courage to speak up in the midst of that. And the only way we'll ever do that is when we self-define. So you have to stand up. You have to stand up, you have to show up, and you have to speak up. That's the moral responsibility of each and every one of us. So you take things like male violence toward women, you take what the pain, the plight of this country, we're the richest, most powerful nation in the history of the world. And yet one out of five children are born into poverty, living in poverty in this country. That's the responsibility of all of us. Boy, all of us got to get our own self-definitions of who we are, and then we've got to define what are we going to stand for. You can't stand just for you. We have this moral imperative and responsibility to be about other human beings. It's part of the essence of who and what we are. We're connected. We're brothers and sisters. We're in this thing together. So all of us got to do our own self definition so you have to do your own narrative work. Integrate the good, the bad, and the ugly. Make sense out of your own life. And what happens is many of us, see all of us come into the world, and we come in as little babies and little girls, and we have this keyboard hanging around our neck. And this keyboard is wired to the most powerful computer in the world, the human brain. And as you went through life, this culture got to type in all kinds of messages on your keyboard. It wanted to judge you. It wanted to judge you on your physical appearance. It wanted to judge you on your race, on your gender, on your orientation, on the zip code that you came from, the formation of your family. All these messages get typed on our keyboard. They go into our mind, and we start formulating our self-concept. We start to see ourselves based on the lies of this culture. And the challenge for each and every one of us as we go through life, we have to control our own keyboard. When you go back and do your narrative work, boy, there are all kinds of things that you need to delete, that you need to override. Every single day, we have to self-define who we're going to stand with, what we're going to stand for, and who we're going to stand against. What kind of man, what kind of woman are we going to be? Boy, that's your responsibility. And the only way you're going to do that is through practice. And it takes some kind of daily disciplines to break down that ego to get back to your authentic selves so you can lead and live with your heart so you can understand the moral imperative that all of us have to elevate other human beings as well. So I want to thank you very much, and I'm going to make this very smooth transition uh, uh, into questions, I think. So uh, go ahead, take a moment. A any thoughts, comments? I think we have a little bit of time. It wasn't too smooth a transition, was it? No. Yes, uh -huh. thank you. Yeah. So the question is, you know, in our own self-definition, we all have to write our narratives. And, uh, you know, I, in my book back there, Inside Out Coaching, How Sports Can Transform Lives, I write out my narrative. And uh, I was one of those boys that had a very painful narrative. I uh, grew up with a father that was angry and abusive. Uh, fortunately for us, he was mostly absent. One of 15 to 20 million children that grew up in a home, growing up in homes filled with domestic violence. Uh, all kinds of misinformation about my masculinity, my manhood, based on the lives of my, uh, my father. When I was a 12-year-old boy, I was brutally beaten and raped by two men. They had accused me of doing something I had not done. It was a penitentiary beatdown. It was a penitentiary rape. That thing was designed to not only break my body, but to break my mind and my soul as well. Now, the irreducible minimum for every human being 
is every one of us wants to be loved and we want to belong. But what happened to me, I got filled with shame. And all of us carry shame. Shame organizes around gender, actually. Shame is this concept that somehow I am so deeply flawed, I am so deeply wounded, I am unworthy of being loved and belonging. Now, I never told another human being about that for over 40 years. For 40 years, I never once verbalized it in my mind. I never once took it to God. For 40 years, every morning in my subconscious mind, I'd plug into the shame of what happened to me. And it wasn't, and shame always grows in silence, secrecy, and self-judgment. It continues to grow in us. So all of us got to learn to come to some kind of authentic community. All of us have got to do our own uh, uh, internal work if we're ever going to be signs of hope. And every person ha in here has a narrative. And all of us on this journey have been told we're too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny, too light, too dark, not man enough, not pretty enough. All of us got all this negative stuff that continues to circulate in our subconscious minds. And that's why we've got to quiet those voices. That inner critic, that super ego, that whole job is to keep you from being, getting back to your very essence. So breaking that down, having some kind of disciplines, uh, certainly journaling. I, I'm not sure there's a better thing you can do than journal. Journaling, journaling forces the left and right, the integration of the left and right hemispheres of your brain. Your right is where all your feeling, your subconscious history is over here. Your left is linear, linguistic, uh, logical. It's the cognitive part. Writing integrates both of those things. Uh, I've also, uh, and you can look this stuff up, but affirmations. Affirmations are present truth about the future, or, or, or future, or present truth about the future you. So when I was a 10-year-old boy, I'll just give you an illustration of how this works. Uh, when I was about a 10-year-old boy, my father was home. And um, he was in the back, I can still picture this, he was in the backyard and he, uh, he hollered at me to go in the house and get him a crescent wrench. I had no idea what a crescent wrench was. And I was scared to death to ask him. I'd grown up with my mother and my grandmother. And I went in the toolbox and I got him a, a tool and he turned around and I put it right in his hand. And he looked at that and he said, well, you stupid SOB. Only oh, he didn't say SOB. He said, I told you a crescent wrench. From the age of 10, that became a hot ember in my hand. A tool became a source of shame for me. I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood where everybody made their living with their hands. I got this concept that I was some stupid SOB. Boy, that continued to loop in my mind for over 40 years. In my house, if something were to break, I would ignore that thing long enough until my wife saw it and either she fixed it or got somebody to fix it. Had this tremendous shame. At the age of 53, I started to learn about affirmations. Affirmations about rewiring re your brain. All of us have this neuroplasticity. None of us are hardwired. None of us are stuck with who and what we are. We can change whenever we make the determination to change. So I wrote myself an affirmation. I am capable and competent of using tools to fix minor problems around the house. Boy, I got out my keyboard. When your brain's in the alpha state, before you get out of bed in, in the morning and before you fall asleep at night, boy, you type that on your keyboard. I am capable and competent of using tools to fix minor problems around the house. Basically, it creates cognitive dissonance in your mind. Stupid SOB, can't use a tool, capable of using tools. And once you do your uh, affirm affirmation long enough, that will become the dominant picture and you won't have this uh, uh, dissonance in your, in your brain. So journaling, boy, uh, is a tremendous discipline, uh, particularly for men. It's just an audience of one venture emotions. If you don't have the capacity to tell people, to verbalize that, or then write it. Uh, write affirmations. Affirmations are always present tense, it's always I, it's always precise, and it's always uh, something you want. So it's always I, affirmation. I'm capable, I lost 70 pounds. I was at the doctor's uh, office and they said, based on your age and lifestyle, we predict that in 10 years, here's where you're gonna be. Now if you do these things, you'll get, uh, we predict you'll be in a healthier place. Before I left that doctor's office, I wrote myself an affirmation. I died and exercise every day because I love my family and want to be with them as long as possible. Wasn't true when I wrote it, but I had this neuroplasticity. I have to take my own pictures and I have to paint my own self-portrait. And I think that's the challenge for each and every one of us. See, we're malleable up here. We have this plasticity. None of us are stuck. You change the moment you decide to change. 
and the formula for change, change always equals discontent times vision times first steps greater than resistance. So you figure out what is it about yourself that you want to change? What is it that you're discontent with? Give yourself a vision for the highest version of you, and then all you got to do is add one or two steps, those little kinds of disciplines, and they have to be greater than resistance. And you know what your greatest resistance is to keep you from changing? From living out of the fullness of who and what you are? It's your own personal comfort zone. It goes back to this voice up here trying to keep you inside this box confined. Boy, you have this power to unleash. Boy, and then, you know, I know, I don't know whether we're in a secular school or non-secular school, but uh, there's all kinds of power out there to tap into, boy, to help, uh, help you be the best you're capable of becoming. But you got to do the work. I mean, I, I just, you know, I mean, you guys, the football team, I don't know what other teams here, but you practice. What do you practice? Boy, you practice repetition to build habits that build character. You've got to have that same kind of practice in the rest of your life some kind of disciplines for your own personal growth and development. And that's up to you. That's not something other people can do for you. You have to take the responsibility to do that. Anybody else? Yes. What role, what role does God play uh, in divine healing? What role does God play in divine healing? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's the other thing. Everybody's got to figure out their own. Uh, a relationship with God and how to appropriate that power uh, in your life as well. So that played a tremendous role in my uh, life. Uh, when my brother died, uh, I, was, I, was, I was a mess uh, when he died. I was in my uh, sixth year of ball and uh, uh, it really, I, I'd been in the midst of a 10 year drug addiction at that point in time and I always had this governor that I had to be able to perform on, uh, on Sundays, which uh, really controlled my drug usage when my brother died. Man, I just, uh, I went to the deep place. And this Jewish psychologist uh, in Baltimore, whose family does all the Jewish funerals, uh, asked me for a meeting and he gave me a book. It was Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a classic. Franco was a German concentration camp survivor. He went into the new camp. He went into the camp with his new bride, his mother's father, and his uh, brother. He was the only one that came out. Uh, his wife died two days after liberation from starvation and malnourishment. And in this book, Franco was a medical doctor, went into the concentration camp, and he came out with a whole form of therapy called logos therapy. Logos having to do with meaning. If you have a why, you can figure out uh, a how, kind of a Nietzsche kind of thing. But um, Franco wrote in this book that changed my life around, he said that the greatest of all human freedoms is the ability to respond to what, is the ability to choose how you're going to respond to whatever life has dealt you. And no matter what life has dealt you, you have an option, an opportunity to choose how you're going to respond to that. And no matter what life has dealt you, you can find meaning in it. Not only can you find meaning in it, but you can add value to it. So when my brother died, we ended up building a Ronald McDonald House in Baltimore that served over 40,000 people. There's a big plaque that's dedicated to him. That taught me I could take my own personal pain, I could find meaning in it, and that add value to other human beings. Well, if you look at my tool belt, what I do, I teach about child sexual abuse. I do an awful lot of work on gender violence. Boy, about the te I, I teach about my own uh, narrative and about the healing and the wholeness that comes out of that. And for me, much of that is God empowered uh, that gave me the freedom, the capacity to do that. So thank you for that question. Anybody else? I, I know that Nate, late, I mean, these guys, these cats have been up since 530, so I'm gonna let them go. But uh, I wanna thank you very much. Um, my concluding thought is just, uh, boy, you got to do the work. Uh, you're signs and agents of hope, but you got to do your own internal work uh, and make a difference in this world. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, before you leave the platform, Joe, we just, I want to do three quick things. Um, the Women's Fund and the Gridiron Club would like to present Joe with gifts of appreciation for coming to Ashland and sharing your, your deep wisdom with us. Um, and so I'll just let that, uh, let that happen. So, um, <laughs> yeah.
go away with some stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's my color, too. I like it. <laughs> temperature changes tonight. We get cooler tomorrow. You'll need this. Uh, we love you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Give me a hug, man. I'm <laughs> Um, we've all been challenged, uh, just before you leave, if you could, um, we've all been challenged in so many ways, and uh, we have some friends at the doors who could be handing out little pieces of paper that have uh, a survey on there. You know, if you've been inspired in particular, if you felt challenged tonight, you want some way of processing that, we'd like to know. Um, we at the Center for Nonviolence and then the many partners that have made tonight possible, you know, we really believe in what... Uh, Joe's been sharing with us tonight, and we really hope that there are a lot of next steps that we'll be able to take together. So uh, watch for that on your way out. Um, Joe will also be in the back uh, signing books if you'd like to have a book signed, if you'd like to get a book. Uh, Terry from the bookstore is selling uh, books uh, about Joe and by Joe, so uh, have a look there as well. But thanks for coming tonight, and have a good evening.